Okay, rolling! Oh! It's been 18 years since Spyro the Dragon launched. Or is it 19? <laughs> For a dragon's age, there's 12,000 treasure in the game. Or is it 14,000? What about this Skylander Spyro character? Now understand he found a magic spell to convert people over to Skylanders for his cause. I'll take that question. That Skylander Spyro is a simple creature. Simple. He has been contained in a remote world and is no threat to the gaming community. No threat! Besides, he is ugly. Ugly? That does it! Looks like I got some things to do. <laughs> Welcome to the very first episode of Blindsided by Nostalgia. This will be my very first video in a series that's going to be my main series on the channel, where I'll be talking about video games from my childhood, or just games I love and obviously have nostalgia for, and hopefully make them entertaining. That'll be my ultimate goal on this channel. And my other goal is that I want to put nostalgia in a more positive light, since I feel that it's become a very, very negative word over these past few years. And so, I want to show that nostalgia isn't always a bad thing. And to do so, I think it would be very fitting for my very first video on this channel, and my very first episode in this series, that I'll be playing the very first video game I ever played as a kid, which is Spyro the Dragon. And uh, I'm going to be doing it right on this show, because what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be playing it on the original copy I had as a kid. Not only that, I will be saving the file with the memory card I had as a kid, along with playing it on the original PS1, as you can probably guess, as a kid. So, it's going to be a long journey since I'm going to be talking about most of the levels in this game. So, let the adventure begin. Sparrow the Dragon begins in a very interesting and unusual way with this interview cutscene. Although the interview gets cut short when this idiot of a dragon takes it upon himself to insult Nasty Nork. He is ugly. That does it. Which then forces Sparrow to fly into action to save all the dragons and to collect the treasure. Our adventure begins in the Artisan homeworld, which I've gotta say is one of the best video game intro levels to date. Artisan serves as a great tutorial level that secretly teaches you the basics. It helps hone your flaming and charging skills against enemies that don't attack you and run away in fear. There's two areas that teaches you how to jump. One of these being consecutive jumping on these pillars, the other is being this hill that you have to hit the high point of your jump to reach this chest and gems. For me personally, the pillars helped teach me how to jump as a kid. I kept failing to get to the third and fourth pillars, but once I did, I felt confident enough to progress. Now I'm going to be taking a look at these worlds in the order that I played them as a kid. So with that being said, the first level up is Stone Hill. Stone Hill reminds me a lot of the Artisan world. It definitely is a tutorial based level that helps develop your flaming charging skills even more against enemies that fight back this time with the farmer and the ram. You also get introduced to the treasure chest, which you have to open up with a key that's found somewhere else in the level. Another thing you get introduced to is one of the most taunting and annoying enemies ever. I don't know one person who doesn't hate this guy. Stone Hill is definitely one of those easy type of tutorial levels, but it is definitely a great extension to the artisan world. Up next is Town Square, which is pretty different from the previous two levels. This level showcases how well the Nishamiya games breathe life into these worlds of Spyro the Dragon. From the bull enemies you take one to two hits depending on how you hit them, and if you charge them and leave them there, they will actually flare the legs, which is pretty funny. To the bulls who are chasing around the Matador Nork enemies around the fountains. And it's not just in Town Square either. It's also in multiple levels throughout Spyro the Dragon. From the enemies of peacekeepers who keep shooting the same cannonball again and again into each other's canyons. To the enemies of magic crafters who laugh at you if you fail to get to them. That also includes boss fights like Dr. Ship who taunts you by doing a cutthroat gesture. Oh, and a bit of warning to new Spyro players. Thank you for releasing me. Get ready to hear that line a lot. 
Let's take a look at one of the very few night levels in the game, Dark Hollow. Dark Hollow has to be hands down one of the most beautiful levels in the entire game, with its nighttime atmosphere and overall level design. And the music for this level, it definitely completes the atmosphere that this level is going for. So as probably most people know by now, Stuart Copeland, former drummer of the police, created the music to the original Sparrow the Dragon trilogy and Sparrow into the Dragonfly. But I don't think most people know how he created the music. So I'm going to have a video link down below and I'd love to show all of you the part I'm talking about. I'm just afraid of potential copyright. So, it starts out with this interview with PlayStation Magazine, and there's a part in it where he shows you how he makes the music to Spyro the Dragon. And at first he adds this horrible, awful sounding beat, and it sounds so weird. And then he adds another, and it sounds slightly better, but it's still pretty bad sounding. But then he adds all this technical stuff and all these effects, and then you start humming along because it's music to Spyro the Dragon. It's amazing how he took something so horrible sounding at the beginning and then made it into basically a masterpiece. I mean, the Spyro games are regarded as some of the best video game soundtracks of all time. Man, I love Star Copeland. Swark. I don't need internet rumors floating around that I love a 65 year old man. Besides the beauty, it introduces another gameplay mechanic armor. The armored enemies aren't static like many other games. There's actually multiple ways how to take them out, whether it be flaming their backside or waiting for them to put their shields down. Now, I hope you're not too warm because it's about to get toasty. Being the first level boss, of course it's going to be easy like many other first level bosses. Well, except for the dogs. Stupid dog! You make me look bad! Oh, come on, come on, come on. What makes these dogs so irritating to deal with is the fact that they cannot be charged and you have to flame them twice. When you get to Toasty, you learn that he has three different stages. And what's really cool is that each stage you defeat reveals more and more of what he truly is. And he's a sheep. I've been fighting a sheep the whole time? And isn't that the one that was in the distorted daily news? Now that we got Toasty out of the way, let's have a look at my least favorite homeworld, Peacekeepers. So, I actually don't have much to talk about Peacekeepers. I mean, it's got personality, I'll give it that. But besides that, it's pretty safe to say... Give me a second here. Ah, much better. For me, there's not much to talk about Dry Canyon, so instead, I'm going to be moving on to Clifftown. The entire game into Clifftown is using height to your advantage. There are definitely a lot of areas where you have to use height to get to other areas where you have to use that height to get to other areas. And to help you out along your way are these Roarwinds. They are an amazing gameplay feature. They allow you to return to previously already accessed areas and they cut out the hassle of doing so by allowing you to return to them almost instantaneously. Overall, Clifftown will definitely test your experience on how to use Spyro's Glide ability. Now that we've been a bit toasty, it's time to move on to a little colder world, Ice Cavern. Ice Caverns is a bit like Clifftown. It's a few gliding puzzles which you'll need to figure out if you want to get all the treasure in the level. Another brilliant way how Insomniac Games breathes life into the Spiral of the Dragon are the different animals you get to interact with throughout your journey. From sheep, to bats, to chicken, to swamp chicken? Holy crap that thing has to be diseased. Oh, here we go. This is hands down my favorite boss level in the entire game, Dr. Shamp. The music matches this guy perfectly, crazy and unorthodox. Before you fight Dr. Shamp, the dragon beforehand gives you a little subtle hint about how to beat him. He should watch his back. Or not so subtle. This boss fight is definitely harder than Toasty, but not by too much. Once you get the concept of what you're doing, you can breeze through him pretty easily. If one thing's for certain, this guy is freaking rememberable. 
for good or reasons, depends on you, but for me, oh, I'll never forget this guy. Alright, so the next level that we're going to be talking about is, oh, Night Flight. Well, I guess it did say I'm going to be talking about most of the levels in the game, so... As a kid, I thought it'd be awesome to fly around levels as Spyro. But then we got these levels. You just fly around and grab all the collectibles. And with the time limit of all things. You don't get a free rope at all. The only challenge here is to figure out is what to get what in what order. That's it. No, I'm not trying to say that they're completely awful. I mean, they're okay. But they had so much potential here. What the heck happened here? Could you imagine a free roam flight level with they put in challenges and different aspects for you to explore? And heck, even different enemies to defeat. To me, that sounds so much cooler and what I wanted from these levels. But instead, they're... This! Now, to calm my disdain, I'll be talking about my favorite homeworld magic crafters! As a kid, I fell in love with this level as soon as I began exploring around. Magic Crafters is a fun and whimsical level, and with my love of odd and unique things, I can see why I still really enjoy it after all these years. Which also includes its music. Just like the level, the music is fun and whimsical on top of being joyful and catchy. Which is why it's my favorite track in original Spyro the Dragon. As much as I love this level, I will admit that aside from the aesthetic and the fun enemies, there isn't much else. Although the realms containing the Magic Crafters do pick up the difficulty. Which leads me into Alpine Ridge. The added difficulty is very evident in Alpine Ridge. There's a lot more enemies that are also placed in strategically harder to reach spots which makes them harder to get to and kill. Also coupled with some harder jumps it does make for a tough level. Since I don't have much more to talk about Alpine Ridge, I think it'd be a good time to talk about the enemy variation in Spyro the Dragon. It is amazing on how many different and unique enemies they are in this one game. Very rarely do you ever see the same enemy repeated in more than one level. And the ones that are repeated aren't used in more than one or two levels aside from the ones that they originally appeared in. The only one that appears a lot is the Egg Thief, which is only because they carry a specific collectible that's tied to only them. Due to how unique and varied the enemies are on top of how they look and act, specifically to the homeworld or realm that they are in, it helps add to the personality and believability of each world and realm. Honestly, I think this isn't recognized or talked about enough. That being said, it's gonna get rocky as we head into High Caves. High Caves is divided into three areas. One being where the different wizards are fighting each other, which is the smallest part of High Caves. As it leads into a small platform segment that transitions into one of the bigger parts being the Supercharged Sector. It's best to think of this place as a training area for the Supercharged. Which, trust me, you will need to get the Supercharged down for when you have to navigate treetops. The reason I consider this place to be a training spot is due to the fact if you happen to fall off or don't make the glide, Fairies will catch you and place you back at the top of the supercharge so you can give it another go. Plus you have multiple locations you have to get to. One of those being where the return home portal is located and another is where an egg thief is. As for the other area, it is infested with the creepiest bugs I've ever seen in a game. Holy dragon on a half pipe, what is that thing? Kill him with fire. Why is killing with fire not an option? Okay, so you can kill them with fire, but only after you get a kiss from a fairy. It makes me wonder what's in that kiss that makes you so powerful all of a sudden. Back to the bugs, they terrified me as a kid and I couldn't stand to go through the caves. So needless to say, I left a lot of gems behind. Anyhow, I adjusted what I had to say about high caves, so I hope you love some magic, since we're headed into Wizard Peak. If you don't already know, and you're curious why the music sounds familiar, you probably recognize it because it's the outro to The Amanda Show! It blew my mind as a kid and I find it an interesting fact to this day. In fact, I wish that more television shows would use video game music for their outros, please. Alright, besides the music, there are quite a few things that set this level apart. Like the double supercharge. This is why I feel Insomniac Games put so much brilliance in the game design. 
Something like the double supercharge never gets boring over time because they rarely use it. Not only that, but they incorporate other uses for the supercharge. So that way it doesn't get stale like for most games, they keep using the same aspect over and over and over again where you just get tired of it. Another thing to know about this level is that it has the last of the dragon eggs. Wait, we're only halfway throughout the game and that's the last of the dragon eggs? I never did understand that even as a kid. It doesn't make much sense to me why the dragon eggs stopped at Magic Crafters. So I figured that I'll bundle Blowhard and Crystal Flight together since they have both the same issues. Blowhard has you chasing down the boss in the most straightforward level in the game, with only a few platforming elements to add some semblance of a level, which is more than what Crystal Flight has going for it. Crystal Flight is the most straightforward out of all the flight levels, which we already know how I feel about those. Overall, Blowhard is the most forgettable boss in the game, and Crystal Flight doesn't do itself any favors. Speaking of something that doesn't do itself any favors, Beastmaker Swap and its color palette. So we have gone from colorful and bright worlds to four shades of brown with hints of green thrown in just for good measure make sure this place looks as ugly as it can. Which Spyro just happens to say exactly how I feel about this level. Nasty Nork is turning our swamp into an electrified junk heap. And it used to be so beautiful. I'm sure it was. As ugly as this rub looks, it can pack a punch for any unsuspecting player since the difficulty is amped up a ton. You'll be shocked by the difference in difficulty between Magic Crafters and Beastmakers. In my opinion, Beastmakers and all of its realms that it contain within are the hardest part about the original Spyro of the Dragon. So let's get the pain train rolling with Terrence Village. I know it's Terra Ace Village, but as a kid, I always thought it was called Terrence Village, so let's just say old habits die hard. Terrence Village is all about tough enemies and hidden secrets. The bulk of this level is the onslaught of enemies, including the Norks that shock you. Once you get through all of that, it's all about the secrets, which this level has quite a few hidden secrets, including a very well hidden staircase. And Spyro, once again, is the voice of the player as he says the same thing I said as soon as I stepped foot in Beastmakers. Good job, Spyro. One day you'll be able to tell all the dragons about your amazing adventures. Sure, but what I'd really like to do is get out of this swamp. How about we continue on the pain train as we take a beating from Misty Bog? This will be a good time to mention that Spyro doesn't respect his elders much at all. Thanks for releasing me. It seems like I've been trapped in here since I was your age. Oh no. Why? I remember. Uh, gotta go. It'll take you back to the artisan home. But first, let me tell you a story. No thanks. See ya. So, I have a theory regarding the portals. The bigger they are, the bigger pain in the ass they are. In my opinion, and many others' opinion, this level has the hardest enemies in the game due to containing the boar enemy. Norks with armor and swords, shrub frogs with freakishly long tongs, and the trees, my old nemesis. Charge! The first time you play Misty Bog, it will both literally and figuratively chew you up and spit you out. Now that we conquer the trees in Misty Bog, it's time to conquer the trees in Tree Chops as the pain train stops at its final destination. Do you remember what I said about big portals? Well, Tree Chops deserves the biggest portal anybody can give it. Tree Chops is regarded as hands down the hardest level by many fans, and for good reason. The level design is disorientating at times due to the level layout being completely designed around the supercharge. Hard to find areas that require multiple superchargers, and tons of areas to fall to your death. When I was saying make sure you had the supercharge down back in high caves, this is why. That was quite a ride, Spyro. You've learned a lot since you were a young glider. Yeah. Well, you could have found an easier spot to get stuck. Oh, oh, no, don't you... Me? Do you know how hard it is to save your ass? 
Although I was glad that this shirt wasn't as hard to buy as it is to save him. Also, the thieves returned. For whatever reason, as they don't even have eggs anymore, they just have gems this time around? I had a very hard time with treetops as a kid, and heck, even now. That being said, I don't hate this level. Sure, it's a pain. I doubt anybody will argue me about that. But I look forward to it since I can see how much better I get and for the challenge. We're almost done with Beastmakers, just the boss being Metalhead and the flight level, then we can get the heck out of this fugly swamp. Unlike the other boss levels where it's more about the boss and the enemies, Metalhead is more about the hidden secrets more than anything else. And the boss is about as rememberable as a tin bucket. He doesn't offer an interesting personality like Dr. Ship or an interesting quirk like Toasty. It's just a huge hulking robot where you have to take out his power sources when they flash green, then chase him, which we'll talk about that mechanic later. And then repeat on what's the half-bit dishwasher bite the dust. After that, just find the hidden areas if you're going out for 120%. Now, I'm going to briefly talk about the Beastmaker's flight level so that way I don't get too redundant about my hatred for these levels. So, on to Wild Flight. I will give Wild Flight this, it's better than the other flight levels. It's more colorful and vibrant than the others. And due to it having two moving targets being the boats and the planes along with narrower passageways, it offers more strategies and challenges. As much praise as I'm given this level, it's still a flight level, so moving on to Dream Reavers. Okay, so when did I start playing LSD Dream Emulator? No, no. I will talk about you in your own video. Until then, I'm talking about Spyro the Dragon. At least I still think I am. I mean, seriously, it's really hard to tell the difference between Dream Reavers and LSD Dream Emulator. I will, pr I promise you, I will talk about you in your own video, okay? I don't know what dreams they're reaving, but I want nothing to do with those dreams. And look, there's this being doofus shooting enemies with a cannon that causes enemies to grow and shrink? Ugh, everyone in Dream Reavers, I would have so many questions right now. Anyways, now that we got access to the cannon, we can shrink the enemies we need to progress. You know what? This is actually a lot of fun! Pew! 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 <laughs> Let's just go on to Dark Passage now. Dark Passage is an interesting light mechanic. The puppy and turtle enemies are innocent in the light, but it's when they end up in the darkness they change into hulking monsters. Oh, uh, did I mention the life source is fools? Eh, but don't worry, Spar has the right idea. The enemies here yeah, can be quite frightening, but you said what? The fool. I'd rather blame the fools. Due to this light mechanic, it plays a small strategy role. Do you try and risk attacking them before the light shots off? Or do you wait and flame the fool to make sure you get a better chance at attacking them? Or does the hit detection get in your way regardless? Don't get me wrong, the hit detection in Spyro the Dragon is very solid. But there's a few rare instances where it just seems to break. Like I said, it is pretty rare, so it doesn't impact the game that much. At the end of the day, Dark Passage ends up being another linear level where the biggest thing is the secrets. So at this time, I think it's time we move on and get high into the sky with our next level, Lofty Castle. I will keep this brief. Lofty Castle feels like they never had a true plan for this realm. Aside from the small castle in the middle, the rest of the level is just small islands that don't seem to have any rhyme or reason. Which makes it easy to misjudge your glides and making it one of the most disorganized and disorientating levels. It is easily one of the most messiest and forgettable realms in the original Spyro of the Dragon trilogy. Do you hate haunted places? Either way, stand by for haunted towers. Coming next. You know, when I hear the word haunted, this is the last place I'll think of. Even the man's possessed armor is enough for me to call this place haunted. Wait, one of the dragons located here actually explains the power of fairy kisses? Hey Spyro, 
All dragons know there's magic in a fairy skiz. See what it can do to your power of flame. Oh, huh. So I guess that explains it. Magic. Well, I mean, I guess there is magic in a kiss, right, ladies? Anyways, this level is notable for having one of the hardest to find dragons along with treetops. None of the other dragons compared to those two. On a side note, I had this blitz happen to me where this gym fell into the abyss below. Thankfully, critting out and re-entering allowed me to grab it. There's not much else exciting to talk about Haunted Towers, so it's time to unleash an inferno on Dream Reaver's boss, Jox. Jox is hands down the hardest boss level. Though saying that doesn't mean much, but it's a huge step up in terms of difficulty from the other bosses. It's got a bunch of platforming that has some tough glides along with somewhat decent enemies. And those time fools, who just waste your time chasing them down. Needless to say, there's quite a bit going on. Before we fight the boss, let's hear what wisdom Avalo has. Any advice before this battle? Advice? Mm. A wise dragon once told me, aim high in life, but watch out for flying boxes. Huh? Wait, like the ones in Crash Bandicoot? I thought you were supposed to collect those. Now it's time to torch Jackson. Holy crap, what is that thing? I get he's supposed to be a jack in the box, but what a butt fugly boss. So he's not the best looking boss, but he can definitely hit you for what it's worth. You have to chase him down while you're also dealing with tight platforming at the same time. He will give you a challenge, but not one that's hard to overcome. Alright, now that we've popped the jack in the box, it's getting nasty as we head to the final home world that contains the final boss, Nasty Nork. Nasty's world is not what you would expect. For being the final home world, you'd think that there'd be a lot of challenges and enemies, but instead it's a very small, non explorable island. I've kind of always looked at this place as the calm before the storm. One detail I love about Nasty's world and all the realms inside of it contain a cool secret if you pay attention. All the dragons you rescue from here on out are dragons you have previously released from the Crystal Prison. They got recrystallized as they tried to confront Nasty Nork and failed. To make it cooler is the fact that there's at least one dragon representing all the different homeworlds. From the artisans to dream reavers. Now let's see what nastiness Nasty Nork has for us as we face Nork Cove. Okay, did I miss something? From being inside the last homeworld, I would have thought it would have been a lot more challenging. But instead, it's a breeze. Only got one thing to say about it, and that's the introduction to the metal barrels and the TNT barrels. It feels so satisfying to ram hard into a metal barrel, see it fly across the air as it slams into an enemy, accompanied with superb sound effects. Or the last, but still satisfying TNT barrels, where you flame them and watch crap blow up. I would like to talk about Twilight Harbor, but I don't know what to say about it besides the fact that it feels like a true final challenge before the final boss, as it has Norks with guns. So then it's time to face the nastiest big boss that there is, at least in this game, Nasty Nork. We're finally face to face with Nasty Nork, and we need a key to get to him. Fantastic. So for those of you who have never seen or played Spyro 1 might be asking, how do you get to the key? Well, let me fill you in on the bullcrap of what you have to do. Remember those colorful thief jerkheads that stole the eggs and then gems? Well, now they have stolen keys. Yep, keys as in plural. So you chase down one key thief, which unlocks a door that leads to another key thief, which then you have to run down, then you finally have the key to fight the nasty green giant. Wait, where is he going? I want to incinerate his eco green we're in and said he runs away from me. This is the huge fault with Nasty's boss fight. It's very unique as there isn't very many final bosses who run away from you without fighting. It definitely makes his boss fight memorable, but almost for all the wrong reasons. You chase him around the same loop again and again. You only get one shot to flame him and if you miss you have to run the loop at least one more time. Something I find fascinating is how you have to chase him. If you simply charge, you won't catch him in time. You have to try to cut corners or do the charge and jump technique which somehow I learned when trying to catch my first egg thief. So it can be very hard if you don't know what you're doing. 
Heck, the first time I fought him, I fell multiple times to try to catch him. After you burn him, you have to chase him again. But this time with retracting platforms, which means you have to move quick. Get to him again and flame him, and down he goes without putting up a fight. That's it. That's the weird final boss, everybody. It's not really a boss when you think about it, but it's so tricky to me thanks to its uniqueness. Ah, uh, but the game isn't done yet. We still have to raid Nasty's Loot. You can only access Nasty's Loot after you got a 100% game completion, which is having freed all the dragons, grabbed all the treasure, and stole back all the dragon eggs. Now this, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I wanted from a flying level, and it sucks this is the only one that we get. Nasty's loot is all about grabbing the insane amount of gems throughout the level. Not only that, but you get to escort some more key thieves. And my favorite part of the level, the flying! Where you don't immediately get to fly anywhere you want, you do get to eventually. The highest point you can jump is the new height you can reach. Since this level goes up and up and up, you have to find the next place to get to the height you need to access the next part with the next key. To make this level even better than the other flight levels is that there's no STUPID TIMER! You get to freely explore at your own pace! Huh, I guess you could say this game ends on a high note. I think everybody would agree with me that Spyro the Dragon is very worthy of the nostalgia behind it. After all, it made a tremendous impact on the gaming industry and gamers, myself included. And its biggest fault that most people would tell you is that it wasn't challenging enough. Well, that's why they addressed that in its sequel, Spyro 2. Ripto's Rage, or Gateway to Glimmer if you're in Europe. And this happens to be tied with my favorite video game of all time, and my favorite out of the original Spyro the Dragon trilogy. And I plan on covering this on this channel definitely at some point, but I want to save it for a special occasion. That being said, I really hope that you enjoyed this video. It's uh, been a long journey, let me tell you that. It's uh, taken me a year and a half to get this video out. I know it might not seem like it, uh, but I had a lot of issues, uh, mainly PC issues being the majority of that. Uh, so I'm just happy to finally get this video out, and uh, I just hope everybody enjoys. So until next time, stay nostalgic. Hey. Oh, hey. Congrats on your first video. Oh, hey, thanks. By the way, thanks to Tom for doing the channel artwork. Oh, you're welcome. By the way, don't be afraid. Afraid? Afraid of what? Oh, you know, falling from YouTube stardom and plummeting into YouTube obscurity. Oh, that. Okay, bye! Thank you to everybody who watched the entire video. It means a lot to me. And speaking of things that mean a lot, I do have to give credit where credit is due. I want to thank Character Girl from DeviantArt. Not only did she create my channel icon, but she also appeared in my recreated Spyro intro, which I gotta admit was actually a lot of fun. So I'll be leaving a link down below to her channel and to Millennium Outcast's channel, but she's the one who also appeared in that Spyro intro. Also, I want to thank Seaver, Bo, and Jay Sean, they helped me out tremendously with my PC issues. And trust me, I had a lot of PC issues during this year and a half that I've been trying to create this video. And finally, I just want to say thank you to all my friends and family. The support has been amazing, and I'm hoping that I can make this my full-time job. But if anything, so far I'm having fun doing it. So until next time, stay passionate.